sure you attend that. Okay, so I don't have all the information, but it's in your school email address. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. So it says it's at 11 a.m., so. Yeah, but I already said that we're not having a call tomorrow for this uh, class, okay? <laughs> I think I just talked about that yesterday, that there's no call tomorrow. Yeah, I forgot about that, sorry. Yeah, uh, Friday's career services has started to take a lot of time, so I'm trying to go heavier at the start of the week to basically mm. catch off on Fridays. Gotcha. Okay. So let's go ahead, and I want to talk about burner installs first, okay? There's a couple things we have to worry about when we install and set up a burner, and that's that's where I want to start today, because after that, we can get more into the troubleshooting, the customer service, the service call side of things, okay? So when we install a burner, we have to install according to local codes and manufacturer's instructions, okay? Manufacturer instructions cannot be lesser than local codes. Okay, manufacturer instructors instructions can only be greater than local codes. Their burner must be the correct height above the bottom of the combustion chamber, and burners are mounted on adjustable legs or on a flange bolted to the burners. They cannot move around. They cannot fall out of the burner themselves. The burner air tube and nozzle must be inserted into the combustion chamber an exact distance per the manufacturer specifications. Okay, this is extremely important. They have to be in an exact distance per the manufacturer specifications. The opening to the furnace must be carefully sealed to prevent air leaks. The nozzle has to be a correct size and in good condition. The nozzle orifice size and the amount of oil pressure we have already talked about determines the rate at which fuel will burn and heat is produced. The nozzle size must match the heating requirements of the heated space. If the nozzle is too small, the space is not going to be heated adequately, not going to have enough heat. If the nozzle is too large, the burner will turn on and off very frequently. Okay, so again, we need to watch the nozzle sizing. It's important. Nozzle wrenches, okay, which is exactly what I'm looking at in this picture on this slide. If you do a lot of oil, okay, you'll want to use a nozzle tool socket wrench. That allows you to not mess up the um, whole nozzle assembly. Otherwise, you're going to use two wrenches, a three-eighths and a five-eighths, okay? Sorry, three-quarters and a five-eighths. But don't twist the nozzle in any way in sort of a sideways condition. You want to make sure the nozzle is twisted, is turned according to the screws. Okay, they have to be tight. Prior to starting the oil burner, you want to remove the air from the lines and pump. There's an air bleed fitting mounted on the pump housing. Okay, and it seals the use also for the pressure gauge installation. If enough air and oil collect in the combustion chamber at night, there could be a puff, a flame, or an explosion. So make sure you don't let a lot of unburnt fuel into that combustion chamber before there's a fire. An explosion can be forceful enough to wreck a building. Okay, make sure you inspect the fire pot, which is the combustion chamber. That's just another word for combustion chamber. If oil is present, shut off the oil valves and vent the combustion chamber. You can remove excess oil if it's large enough quantity by using a pump. You can use rags. You can remove, you can use anything to get that oil out of the combustion chamber. Continue removal until all, dam, all danger of oil fumes is gone. You want to use an explosion proof flashlight. Most flashlights now don't have explosion capability. So use an explosion proof flashlight. To make sure that they're to make sure you don't ignite any fumes around, but you cannot have standing oil in the combustion chamber. Okay, I've seen burners, I've seen boilers lift off the ground because of a, what we call a puff back or unburned fuel. Don't do it. Air in the oil line will foam bubbles. Okay, again, we talked about this when we were bleeding tanks. 
or in which, when we were talking about pumps, air in oil lines form bubbles that will result in the oil not being pumped properly. It will result in what we call blowbacks, that's flames coming the wrong direction. It will cause flame failures. Oil lines have to be completely purged of air. A two-pipe system reduces the chance of oil remaining in the system, yet air still can be trapped in high spots in the line. A leak in the oil line will almost always cause air in line problems. Always check and confirm the correct size fuel oil nozzle. Be sure it's in the center of the air duct. Okay, be sure it's in the center of the duct of that gun. In other words, the whole air gun coming out of your burner. Electrodes have to be clean and in the correct relationship to the nozzle, you're going to use an electrode adjustment tool. And I showed you that when we did electrodes. Nozzles come in various capacities. All are based on 100 PSI. Capacities generally range from 0.4 GPH to 28 GPH. Okay, however, some nozzles can feed up to 100 gallons per hour. Okay, if you ever work on that size burner, you're going to require special training, okay? 100 gallons per hour, special licensing applies for that. A 1 GPH nozzle delivers 140,000 BTUs per hour. If the overall efficiency is 60%, the usable heat is 84,000 BTUs per hour. Poor oil delivery may be due to clogging in the main oil filter, the pump filter, or the nozzle filter. Okay. Flame failures. This is part of servicing. This is part of troubleshooting. Flame failures can be caused by the following things. If you take a look at the list, all of those um, can be causes of flame failures. Okay, oil tanks being empties, oil tank not being vented, clogged filters in oil line, ice in fuel line. Eh, that's a problem. Something's too cold. Loose oil line connections. In other words, air in lines, dirt in the supply lines water in the supply lines, loose wiring connections, motors not running. Okay, there's a reset button on the burner motor. You may want to check that. Defective oil pumps can cause problems. Okay, can cause flame failures. Makes sense. Pump losing a prime. Okay, the only way a pump can lose prime is if there's an air leak someplace. Changing pressure of low pressure at pump. In other words, the coupling between the pump and the motor is wearing out. Or you can have a clogged nozzle. All of these are reasons for flame failures. Would you say? Would you say? Okay. St we could also have damaged nozzles or improperly installed bypass plugs. Okay. We talked about all of this as we've gone through this as we've talked about nozzles, pumps, and everything else like that. Another cause of problems, no spark at the electrodes. Think about all of these things that are listed under here. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Loose wiring, bad transformers, low voltages, cracks in electrode porcelains. You remember the electrode has a porcelain around it. If that's cracked, I might not have spark at electrodes because it might be sparking to ground through the crack. Electrodes having carbon on them. Electrodes spacing too far apart or too close together. High voltage wiring coming loose. Okay, these are all reasons why we win. might not have a spark at the electrodes. Let me ask you a question. Are you ever going to put your voltmeter on the output of a transformer? No. No, that would be a really bad idea. Okay, your your voltmeter can't handle 20,000, 10,000 volts. It just can't handle it. You'll melt it. Okay, don't do it. But can I see the spark if I'm looking close enough? Can I see the spark if I look into the burner compartment? Yeah. Yeah, I can. A proper oil flame 
is a yellow flame. If there's insufficient air, the flame will be a dull orange or a red. Okay, smoky tips to the flame indicate a properly adjusted flame. Again, yellow flame is what most of our oil boilers are. They do have some blue flame ones, but we're not talking about that. The majority of the oil flames are going to be yellow, not orange. Okay, what type, when you take a smoke reading in the, in the furnace flue pipe, what level of smoke do you want? Sort of like a dark gray. How about zero or a trace? Yeah. Okay, that's even better. I don't want smoke. Okay, don't want smoke. Okay, the draft is usually measured by air pressure drops. It should be about 0.02 to 0.05 inches water column. Okay, some oil burner motors, when you get the motor, they could be reversible. You'll have a wiring diagram. Some motors may allow you to change it from clockwise to counterclockwise. Make sure the motor isn't running backwards. Okay, I've been on a number of service calls where I was called out as a secondary company and the problem was the motor was running backwards. Okay, it's sort of, sort of a ridiculous thing to find. I didn't think you can actually install those backwards. Well, the, the, yeah, some of these motors, like what's here in this picture, okay, actually allow you to change the wiring around. So motors can run clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. Okay. So just make sure the if you ever see it, you can look at it just by telling, looking at the shaft end of the motor, and it will tell you for shaft end, is it working counterclockwise or clockwise? Okay, and usually if the motor's mounted on the left-hand side of the burner, okay, it's going to be a clockwise rotation. If the motor's mounted on the right-hand side, it's going to be uh, counterclockwise. Okay, so the motor, depending on the side that the motor's installed on, it's going yeah. to go in the opposite direction of that, of where basically, it's located. Basically, okay. and, the, and the reason for it is, think about that squirrel cage in there. Okay, the squirrel cage is catching air and blowing it down the burner tube. That makes sense. Okay, so the squirrel cage always has to run in a certain direction so the scoops catch the air. Okay, inspect the electrodes wires. If, the, if they're cracked or brittle, replace them. If anything is cracked on the electrode um, ceramic, Replace it. It's more. It's easier to replace it while you're there doing a preventative, or after installation, than it is um, to go back on a service call. Okay, because you get the customers in a good mood if you're doing preventative maintenance. The customers in an ugly mood if they're cold and want hot water or heat. So it's much easier to do preventative maintenance properly. The more frequent a unit starts, the greater the quantity of soot is deposited. A correctly sized oil burner will operate less frequently, in other words, come on and off less during a heating cycle, and it will deposit less soot in the furnace and the chimney. My biggest area of soot in any oil furnace or boiler is when that burner first comes on and hasn't heated up the system yet. As soon as the burner is doing full combustion, has stabilized, we call it. We have less soot being deposited. So if a burner is cycling on and off during a call for heat, if a burner isn't running long enough, okay, because the furnace is too small, okay, or too large, we're going to develop a lot of soot. It's going to become a maintenance nightmare. Okay, so the burner running correctly, being sized properly, handles the best soot situation. If an oil line is dirty or clogged, blow it out with a nitrogen gas. Do not use compressed air or oxygen. Mixing compressed air or oxygen is a very bad idea. 
okay? And when you blow out an oil line, you have to disconnect it from both ends of the oil line. You disconnect it from the tank filter, and you disconnect it from the burner, and you go one direction. You want to always have somebody else there with you, if preferable, to hold that container that you're blowing the oil line into, because you're going to blow out about a gallon of oil there. You don't want it all over someone's basement. Okay, so again, troubleshooting starts with the installation and the annual maintenance. Any questions on that? Okay, since there's no questions on that, okay, let's talk a little bit about customer service. Okay. Customer service comes naturally to some people. Some people it doesn't come naturally to. So some of this stuff may seem really dumb to you as we go through this. Some of this stuff just is not, um, may just seem as something that just should be second nature. But when you get to a customer, okay, you want to have, you want to meet and greet the customer. We've talked about this before. You want to talk to the customer. Okay, it's not a bad thing to make friends with the customer's pet, okay, especially if it's um, that little ankle-biting chihuahua, okay, because you don't want to get, you don't want to have that thing running under your feet the entire time you're there, okay. This is your customer's first impression of who you are as a technician. When you first show up at the house, it's your customer's first impression. Are you knowledgeable? Do you know your job? They're going to make that determination within 30 seconds of meeting you. Okay, introduce yourself. Okay, they want a name. Now, currently, I would not shake hands for the customer, but I'd ask permission to enter the house, okay? Treat your customer's house like it's your own, or maybe better than your own, okay? Put the booties on, okay? Offer to not walk through the house in shoes. Okay, because you want to make sure that you don't leave anything behind that that customer is going to have to clean up. In today's environment, I mean, quite honestly, you have a pair of gloves on. You have a pair of latex gloves on. You make sure that that customer is 100% feeling safe with you in that house. Enter the house or business. Bring your tools with you. Okay. Don't say, oh, yeah, I have to run out to my truck real quick for my tools. No, have your tools right with you. It makes the customer see that you're ready to go to work. If you're walking on expensive rugs or floorings, quite honestly, I don't walk across that stuff in boots, okay? Even if I put booties on for average thing, I'm not going to walk across someone's $600 oriental carpets in booties, okay? If they don't want shoes in the house, I take the shoes off. I'll carry them with me because I want to put them back on when I'm in the basement, but I'm not going to walk across someone's expensive carpeting, okay, even if they say, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, I feel more comfortable making sure I don't bring oil in your house, okay? Be careful about your surroundings. Ask the homeowner if there's a different door they want you to use when coming in and out. Explain to the homeowner, I'm going to be carrying oil and oil-soaked supplies in and out here. I have to change filters and so on and so forth. I would prefer not to use your front door. Do you have a basement door or a back door? Ask the customer about any issues there to resolve. Okay, your dispatcher may have told you a few things, but I'm going to tell you right now, dispatchers don't always get the correct information from the customer. Always ask the customer hey, I hear your burner's not working, or I hear you have to have to click the reset button three or four times. You always want to ask the customer. When walking through the house, in your initial walk to the thermostat, making sure vents are open, whatever, notice whether or not they have baseboards or air vents. Again, your, dis your dispatcher, should have told you if it's a boiler or a furnace, but again, you'd be surprised how many times that gets wrong. And all of a sudden you're talking about forced air heating, like the blower motor may be out or something like that, and the customer looks at you strangely and says, wait a sec, it's not a forced air system. 
it's a boiler. Okay, that feels you make that feels you that makes you look pretty dumb occasionally. Okay, make sure you know all of that stuff. Are the supplies directed towards the heat loss? In other words, are they on the outside walls? Okay. Locate the thermostat. Thermostats being in con good condition are pretty important, right? What about mercury thermostats? What have I told you about mercury thermostats? Try to get the customer to switch over that they're no good. Well, try eventually to get the customer to switch over. That is correct. Mercury is a hazardous material. What else was very important about mercury thermostats? Making sure it's level. Yeah, making sure, it's, making sure it's level. Okay. Thermostats should not be in direct sunlight. They should not be over heat sources. You'd be surprised how many times I see a thermostat mounted above a lamp. It's not going to read right. It's going to read the temperature of the air rising off the lamp. Shouldn't be over an entertainment center. There's a lot of heat there. Okay. Is the thermostat near an air return? That's the best place for it to be, near an air return. Does a thermostat need new batteries? There's a lot of thermostats that don't work right if the battery ind indicator is on. If it says low battery, before you go any further, replace that battery. Okay, I've charged people a $200 service call to go replace their thermostat batteries. Okay, make sure you replace the batteries. Okay, locate the equipment. When you're going down to the basement and the system's running because you've already turned on the thermostat, notice, was the basement door hard to open? When you opened the basement door, did a sudden rush of air blow by you down the basement steps? Tells you if there's enough combustion air. All of these things are important to think about. Check the equipment installation. Okay? Check the equipment installation. Okay? Anything that doesn't seem right from installation has to be noted. Be very, very careful if your company is the one that installed the equipment. Okay? You can make recommendation. They're great upsells. They're great upgrades. Okay? If the filter is a crappy filter that you can see through, you may want to advise the customer to upgrade their filter. Okay? So keep an eye open always for upgrades. But again, if you're there for a service call, a no heat problem, Okay, you've got to keep an eye out for reasons why there's no heat. You haven't even touched the equipment at this point other than the thermostat. Ask the customer, does the house feel dry? Okay, all of this stuff is stuff where you can actually do upgrades and your boss in the future is going to thank you for this. You're building a relationship anytime you make a customer more, and more comfortable. That's something I learned long ago. Customer comfort is by far the most easiest thing to deal with. You're building a relationship. Diagnose the issue or troubleshoot the problem. An evaluation should take about 15 to 30 minutes. Okay, estimate the cost of the repair if the problem is minor and the system is newer. If the problem is major, or the system is older, you may want to estimate the repair cost and a replacement cost. Okay, boilers, 20 years should be the average lifespan of a boiler. Uh, furnaces, forced air equipment, okay, is a, actually a little bit better. Okay, 10 to 15 years, 15 to 20 for the, some of the better names and better manufactured equipment. Things don't last forever. Okay. Now, I had a rule for service techs way back when. If you did not diagnose the problem in 30 minutes, you had to call for help. If you did not diagnose the problem in 30 minutes, you had to call for help. 
okay? Because quite honestly, if you're look, sitting there looking for at a system for 30 minutes and you can't figure out what's wrong with it, you're not going to figure it out. You're going to start changing parts out of frustration. Repair the system or return with parts. After repaired, cycle the system twice. Why do I want to cycle the system twice? It could work the first time, but not the second. Yeah. There's a lot of times you may go out to the system and it works the first time and not the second. Clean up your work area and around the equipment. Always leave the equipment cleaner than you found it. It really doesn't matter how good of a job you've done if you leave a mess. The customer won't want you to come back. Okay, you can spend all the time in the world fixing the equipment, making sure everything runs properly. But if you leave a mess, if you leave fingerprints all over, if the customer smells oil when you're done, the customer's not going to want you back. Okay? So, again, customer will not want you to come back. Be careful. Fill out the invoice. Your bosses, I'm sure, will tell you this. Always record the model and serial numbers. Record all your readings your pump pressures, your vacuum gauge readings, anything else you've taken readings on and what you found. Make sure you explain the problem and the solution to the customer. Point out any recommendations. Explain the time and material pricing or flat rate pricing. Does anybody know what flat rate pricing is? Can you give me an explanation? Anybody? It's okay if it's wrong. How long it takes the job to do? Well, that's time and material. Okay, we record the length of time on a job and how many parts we use. What about flat rate? The base pricing for the material. Okay, when you go into a when you go into a like a car repair place, okay, and they look up in a book and they tell you this repair is going to cost you this much. That is flat, flat rate pricing. So in other words, I have a price for the repair. It includes my parts and my labor. So I'm giving the customer one number. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how long that repair takes me, but the price for the repair is what the customer is going to pay. That flat rate number includes all the overhead. In other words, it includes percentages of what it costs me to run your truck. It includes percentages of what it costs me to pay the insurance bill. So that flat rate number includes everything that it costs me to service that customer. Plus, there's a profit margin built into that flat rate number. Okay, so there's no nickel and diming on time and material. Well, it only took him 45 minutes and he charged me for an hour. Okay, there's nothing like that going on. There's nothing like that going, yeah, I looked up that part. You charged me 20 bucks for it. I can buy it on Amazon for 5 Okay, that's not even in the conversation because we give them a flat rate price. That's flat rate pricing. Most contractors are going to flat rate pricing these days. Okay, because it's very little argument. When leaving... Turn the system on with the thermostat. This tests the system for the final time and also makes sure that the switches are turned on. Make sure you've disconnected your jumpers on the CAD cell. The system will not start if you've left your CAD cell jumper in place. And it also shows, that the, custo shows the customer that you actually fixed the system. Okay, make sure you turn the system on and off with the thermostat. I've even said to a customer, hey, can you stand by that door, and when I turn this thermostat down, let's make sure the system comes on. Okay, I've actually done that before with difficult customers. I want them to know that we've checked the system, and it's running when I have left, and I've cycled it on and off with their thermostat. Why do I want to do that? What, what's important about that from a customer standpoint? They can trust you? Well, they can, yeah, they can trust me, but there's another reason it's so important. 
So they know that you did your job. Yeah, so that there's no question, no question at all, that when you leave that house, that system was operational and was being controlled by the thermostat. So any additional repairs that are needed a week from then or whatever can be billed. Okay, it can't be under a callback anymore at that point because the system is operational. Always thank the customer for their business. Have a great day. Thanks for letting me come out and take care of this. Okay, always thank the customer for business. Who is your customer? When you're a service technician, who is your customer? Anybody. Who is your customer? I mean, they're sort of your job, right? Or the general public? Well, that's part of it. Who else is your customer? What about the contractor you're working for? Are they your customer also? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, you have more than one customer as a service technician. You have that end customer who is really your boss's customer. Your customer is your boss, is the contractor you're working for. But your customer is also that end, the homeowner, the business owner, or whatever. So you actually have two customers. Okay, by keeping one customer happy, you're keeping your contractor happy. But you also owe it to your contractor to make money, so you can't just give everything away. Okay, I know one technician who's a, who's a wonderful technician, and it took us about four years to convince him that by keeping his customers happy, he can't give everything away. Okay, he used to figure out a way to count every call he went on as a callback, so he wouldn't have to bill his customers. Okay, it took us about four years to convince him that his time is worth more than that. Okay. You have two customers. Okay, servicing oil burners. Okay, let's talk a little bit about different things you're going to find when you're servicing an oil burner. All of this is part of troubleshooting. That's our purpose here. We've talked about how burners work. Now we have to talk about problems. If the burner motor does not start, starts and locks out or cycles on and off okay if it doesn't start the relay may not close or the contacts are dirty there might be a safety lockout that's open could have a bad relay coil could have low voltage could have an open high limit control all of this is electrical could have broken wires loose connections could have a bad transformer, could have a bad thermostat, could have a stack switch problem, okay? Motor overload could be open. In other words, I might have power to the motor and the motor overload is open. There's a little red button on most oil burner motors. You may have to close that. So all of these things on these two slides that I've just shown you, how do you find them? What are you going to do? Meter readings? Yeah, it's all based on meters. Okay, all of this, you're going to use meter to find. Start with line and work your way through. Open and closed is what we're looking for. Two readings, either zero or line voltage. That's what I'm looking for. If the burner starts and locks out on safety, it basically means there's no fuel at the oil nozzle. I just went through this whole thing. Okay, check the easy stuff first. Is it possible someone left an oil valve closed? Is it possible the fuel oil tank is empty? I saw someone take apart an entire oil system, tear the burner down, tear everything else down, and there was no fuel. Okay, very easy solution. 
put fuel in the tank. Okay, then we go to clogged strainers and screen, screens and stuff like that. But all of this is troubleshooting stuff, things to look at. How are you going to find any of this stuff? Visual. Most of this is visual. Some of okay. it you need your gauges for? You might need a oil pressure gauge. You won't use your same gauges, but you might need an oil pressure gauge for the pump pressure being too low. Okay? But if you watch the flame, will I be able to see if that's that? It's going to be a very small flame. Okay, pump not working. If my burner runs, if my burner motor runs, everything else comes on, I have spark or whatever, and my pump's not working, I'm going to go down that road. Don't even need pressure gauges. Okay, most of this is visual. Fuel comes out of the nozzle, but there's no ignition. In other words, if I'm looking through the peephole, okay, the viewport of the boiler or furnace, every one of them has it. Okay, if I see fuel being sprayed out of the nozzle, but there's no ignition, I know I have uh, some spark issue, okay? If my burner motor's running, I can pro and lights are working in the house or whatever, I can probably say, eh, my line voltage is okay. And that's where you're going to start going down. Without taking anything apart, I can check the transformer. Don't have to check it. I open it up, I can test the transformer. While I have that open, I can look for ignition wires worn looser with dirty connections. Then I can pull the nozzle assembly and I can check for the cracked insulators. I can check for electrodes properly. Okay, so I'm going to check the obvious stuff first before I take anything apart. I don't want to take anything apart if I don't have to. Because the minute I pull the nozzle assembly out, I now have oil that is no longer contained in a line because I've had to loosen an oil line. Okay, if I have fuel to nozzle, ignition okay, but no flame. In other words, I can see the spark. I know, my, I know I'm getting fuel to the nozzle, but I have no flame. Okay, I have a clogged nozzle. Something is wrong with the nozzle. Okay, there's one other case. If this is mount, if the burner's installed in a cold area, I could have fuel that's too cold. Okay, excessive air or too much draft, I can actually blow the flame off the end of the nozzle if there's too much draft, but you'll be able to see that visually. Electrodes in the wrong position. Okay, if it's not, if it's the electrodes are not set properly, you're not going to have flame. Okay, all of this is fuel to the nozzle. Okay, ignition okay, but no flame. Flame burns only for a few seconds, and then everything shuts down. It's a flame sensor problem. CAD cell may not be able to see the light. Stack switch is not operating properly. Yeah, you could have air that's too cold. I rarely see this. Or the flame just went out, not enough air. But most of the time, you have a flame sensor problem. Okay? Flame only burns a few seconds and goes out. Most of the time, it's a flame sensor problem. You might have a combustion air problem, but that is rare in this case. Okay. System cycles, but doesn't lock out. Okay, in other words, the system comes on and off, it cycles, it runs five minutes, shuts off, run, waits ten minutes, runs another five minutes, shuts us off. Cycles, but doesn't lock out. It's a thermostat issue or a limit switch issue. Okay, either the limit switch is set too low or it's over firing. In other words, there's too much oil going in there. Nozzle size may be off. Okay, thermostat size. 
Most thermostats have a differential. Might be set too close, but again, in a residence, thermostat might not just not be working properly. Might be time for a new thermostat. Digital thermostats, you don't have this problem with that often. If I were seeing a burner cycling on and off very, very fast, I'd be looking at my limit switches, my over-firing. I'd check that nozzle size, and then I'd check airflow. Burner not operating correctly. In other words, they're complaining of smoke, soot, odors, or pulsating sound. Sounds, homeowners are very, very sensitive to sounds. Oil pressure could be incorrect. Flame could be touching the outside of the combustion chamber. You might not have enough draft. You might have a dirty chimney. Draft controls may be out of adjustment. You might have dirty flue pipes. Or you might have the combustion chamber or heat exchanger has a leak. That signs up pulsating, smoke, soot, and odors. There's something wrong with the flame. Okay. Could also be caused by poor, poor mixing of air and oil. The nozzle could be worn, loose, dirty, or it drips. It doesn't have a good oil shut off. Oil pressure can be too low or too high. Again, poor mixing of air and oil. Poor air velocity and turbulence. In other words, we're not, we are not putting enough air down the air tube and we're not spinning it fast enough. Could be not enough air. Could be the fan blade is are starting to go bad. That little fan, the blower motor that's in the blower wheel, the squirrel cage that's in the burner compartment could be starting to go bad. The motor could not have bearings that are getting, they could have bearings that are going bad called tight bearings. Things like that. Again, poor mixing of air and oil. Okay, it's always going to be, okay, cause it's going to show up as um, basically it's going to show up as um, smoke, soot, odors, and a pulsating sound. Okay. Puffbacks. These are probably the worst. They make the biggest mess. Occasionally you'll get a call with a puffback. What that basically means the burner had a small explosion in it and put soot and smoke all over someone's basement or house. Okay, you'll walk in and every wall in the house will have sort of a sooty look to it. Okay, customers, when you come to these calls, are pissed. Okay, they're not going to be happy. Okay, this is a lot of times caused by water in the oil or delayed ignition. Okay, delayed ignition is the one that's caused by a technician. Electrodes can't be, might not have been positioned properly. They might have been left loose. Insulators might not have been cleaned or they may have gotten sooty very fast. Nozzles could be worn, loose, dirty, or dripping. Voltage drop when the burner starts. Again, we might have electrical issues. Oil pressure set too low or too high. Transformer leads could be loose or dirty, transformer not operating correctly. Is any of this stuff on this slide stuff that you shouldn't, you might not have seen when you're doing a preventative maintenance? Anything here that should have gone by you when you're doing a preventative maintenance? No. Everything on this slide is stuff you should have seen when you're doing a preventative maintenance. Okay, nine out of ten times, puffback calls come within 30 days after preventative maintenance has done been done. No excuse for these calls. The only one you cannot control as a service technician is the water and the oil. You have no control over that. Okay, everything else you can control. So that's where this becomes important. This is all stuff that's controllable during preventative maintenance. Noises. Again, noise is usually something is loose or something is not lined up. Loose fan, loose shutter, worn pump, dirty strainer, air and oil lines. 
humming transformer, loose draft controls, couplings worn. Okay, all of this stuff is stuff that is loose. Now, in a year's time, this stuff normally doesn't loosen up if it was tightened and checked when you did your preventative. Okay, so all of this stuff, with maybe the exception of the motor bearing issue, is stuff we should have found during the preventative maintenance. Noises. Customers hate noises that have changed. It wakes them up in the middle of the night. The biggest problem service call you're ever going to get, okay, that always had, takes a while to figure out, is if the fuel consumption is too high. But it is the one you need to pay the most attention to because it has the biggest problem, has the biggest possibilities of a lawsuit later on. You've got to pay the most attention to this, okay? Fuel consumption too high. You have to rule out all of these items. Nozzle being worn. Combustion chamber being dirty. Too much combustion air. Poor mixing of air and oil. Not enough draft over the fire. Air leaks. Oil pressure too high or low. Over or under fired. You have to rule all of this stuff out. Okay? Why do I word it as ruling it out when we have high fuel consumption? Anybody? So we know there's not a problem with the system? Um, if I rule all of this out, and if I had a conversation with the customer following this, and if I said to the customer, okay, we've taken everything out of that's wrong with the system. Everything on the system is running properly. Now let's have one further question on fuel consumption. Have you changed anything in the house? Okay, in other words, did you add an addition? Did you change it? Did you enlarge the house? Did you start heating an extra area, maybe by heating your garage? Okay, if the customer says no to that, and if I can prove high fuel consumption, where is my problem? There's a leak? There's a leak someplace. Okay, there's a leak. If all of this stuff is good, if the house has not changed, and if my oil use for a similar temperature period of time has gone significantly higher, there's a leak. Got to find it. Okay. That's where we start having lawsuits. If you've gone through all of this, and if nothing else has changed, there's a leak. Now, all of a sudden, if I have an oct if I have a September with negative 10 degree days, high wind chills, and everything else like that, yeah, my oil usage is going to go up. I can explain that. Okay, and we use degree heating degree days to check that. But if I have a situation where my fuel consumption goes up and I have similar temperature like to a year ago or a month ago, and all of a sudden my fuel consumption has gone up. I have a leak. Okay. Now, there is one other possibility on fuel consumption, and you guys are going to laugh about this one. I went out to somebody's house on a fuel consumption back probably 12 years ago or so, where their fuel consumption went way up. Okay. Um and nobody could understand why the fuel consumption went up. I mean, they went they were using about 100 gallons more of oil a month. Everything checked out. There was no leak. Everything was above ground. Could see the entire oil line. Could see where everything is. And 100 gallons a month is a relatively high fuel consumption. Okay? We only figured it out when the homeowner put a camera onto the oil fill line of the oil tank. They hung a camera up above it. The teenage son was using the oil out of the oil tank to fuel his pickup. Okay, he didn't want to pay for diesel, so he had a diesel truck and he was um, 
filling up his truck out of the oil tank. So I, every once in a while you'll find oddball stuff like that, but it's not frequent. Okay. Any questions on the troubleshooting side of it? Again, you're going to practice this both online on the simulators and in the shop. But any questions on anything we just went over? No. Okay. One more short troubleshooting thing I want to go over. Okay, in your, in your course, which is on the screen right here, okay, um, take some time over the next day. There's two videos linked in here. There's fuel delivery and there's an oil service call video. Both of those are somewhat cheesy little videos, but at the same time, they contain a good, good information that really needs to be seen by people who are be doing oil stuff. The fuel delivery is important because sooner or later you may take a chance of watching, you may take a chance of working for an oil company. And when you work for an oil company, occasionally you're going to have to go out on fuel deliveries. Okay? It's just the way it is. The smaller oil companies especially you're going to be going out on oil um, deliveries occasionally. Watch that video just so you're aware of it. Again, comes up some of that information comes up in state exams. Okay, so I want to specifically point that out to you. Okay, the other thing I'm going to point out to you is the NORA chapters 14 and 17. Okay, all are part of troubleshooting. NORA. 14 and 17, which is in the 522 customer service module. Now, as I said earlier in this, we do not have an online session tomorrow. So nobody has to come on to the online call tomorrow. Okay, the first termers in Waterbury, I believe, do have a call with career services. You should have gotten an email on that. But this call, we are a day ahead on lecture, did it for a reason because I want to give you time to get all assignments in. This course ends on May 29th. Everything must be turned in by 11.59 p.m. on May 29th. Anything after that will be ignored. Okay, again, this course ends at 11.59 p.m. on May 29th. Okay, and you'll get more information sometime next week on your next course, which will be hydronics. Okay, so, but again, i got to make that clear. I'm giving you time tomorrow to get things turned in. Let's make sure we get things turned in. Any questions? No. Pretty direct. Okay, that's all I have for today, folks. So we will talk to you on Tuesday. Remember, Monday's a holiday.